Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to what is our first um, e-lecture, uh, us being IHILT, the Institute for History of International Law at Tilburg, of this new academic year. Last year we had uh, six speakers, and this year we're going to have six speakers again, spread out over the coming academic year. And we're very happy and proud that the first speaker, the opening address uh, for this academic year, is uh, our guest today, Dr. Sif Burr, from the University of Bar Ilan in um, Israel. Um, Ziv has been working on international criminal law for some time and its history. Within, let's say, the um, booming business of the history of international law, uh, the history of international criminal law is fast becoming an important sub-branch and Ziv is one to uh, work very profoundly and from, from a long-term perspective on that and is going to tell us about the fact that the perspective is indeed much longer than is generally held in introductions to the history of criminal law in criminal law books. Ziv, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Rathafo, for inviting me. And let's jump in. Um, if you open any international criminal law book, it would state, would state that international criminal law was born at Nuremberg. Now, there's actually two versions for that story. One, one version is the pi piracy-oriented version. And it says, before uh, 1945, international law was states oriented. It only had states only, only states made it and it addressed only states. There was one exception. There was one uh, 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 previous international criminal international crime and that's piracy. Pirates were international and criminal to which universal jurisdiction was applied because they were enemies of mankind, was this homine generis and international authors, and you need to trust me that disturbers and enemies of the peace or of tranquility are synonyms of the term outlaw. And the story goes that after 1945, in order to apply universal jurisdictions to war criminals and, and perpetrators of crimes against humanity and aggression, that doctrine was copied from piracy and applied uh, to war criminals and these other criminals, and that was the birth of international criminal law. There's a second version to the story, and, and that version says, no, the real story is not one of a doctrine being copied, but of a birth of an institution. Nirenberg was the first ever international criminal tribunal, and what I'm going to try to do in, in this presentation is to question both versions of the story. Now, if you open the same book that I said, any book of international criminal law, they will always mention these six earlier cases and then say that they are irrelevant, but they will at least mention them. So the cases are the trial for, of Conradin, King of Jerusalem, for what we would call today aggression, the uh, trial of William Wallace for uh, war crimes, the trial of Peter von Hagenbach by a tribunal of several sovereign entities for uh, what we will may call crimes against humanity, but violations of the law of God of, and man, which is that, that period's term for international law. The trial of Napoleon, or the suggestion to try him, and, and, and which in the end resulted in his uh, imprisonment without a trial of Napoleon for aggression. And what is sometimes termed the birth of, of, of modern law of war, the creation of the liberal code, and afterwards the trial of Wirtz for war crimes. If you don't know the term, deadline was created by Wirtz. In, in, he was a southern commander during the American Civil War and at a certain point in the southern commander of a prisoners of war camp and they didn't have enough wire. So they drew a line in the sand and told the northern soldiers, the northern prisoners of war, that if they crossed the line, they will be dead. That was the birth of the term deadline. And so he was tried after the war for war crimes, and it sometimes claimed that it was the only war crimes trial after the American Civil War. And lastly, the suggestion to prosecute the German Kaiser and the German war criminals in international criminal tribunals after World War I. If you see, all the examples are relevant for the first version of the story. Only two version, only two examples are, are relevant for the sec second version of the story, but immediately after these cases are mentioned, you find a paragraph like this. 
So the late Bassioni is calling me a wishful thinker. Okay, let's see if I'm, <laughs> if I'm, if I'm, if I'm a wishful thinking. Thinking otherwise is essentially the product of ICL protagonist's desire to give historical substance to this discipline. So let's turn to the first version and that version I, I try to tackle in, in this paper. Was the doctrine copied from piracy only in 1945? So I have for you a secret American memorandum from 1944 regarding the creation of the trial of war criminals by a mixed inter-allied military tribunal. What would be the name of that tribunal later? Nirenberg? Or in, in Tokyo? Let's see what they say. They are, they are examining the issue of universal jurisdiction, meaning trying the war criminals uh, for the crimes, no matter where the crimes were committed. And the memorandum say it's fundamental, fundamental in considering this question to bear in mind that for the last century at least, what I show in my paper, it's not the last century, but actually almost a millennium, war crimes have been considered as crimes against society and war criminals, enemies of mankind. And they have been termed hostess homine generis and outlaws. Okay, but that's maybe the Americans reinventing his, the history in order to, to give background to, to give precedent to what they're doing. So let's go further in time. Before we go further in time, there's even explicit mention in that memor memorandum that the jurisdiction on war criminals is the same non-territorial jurisdiction that was applied to pirates, meaning universal jurisdiction was applied historically to both. But let's see if it's the Americans inventing history or it's actual. So moving back to World War I. The story is of a group of, Amer of German pirates that, that have committed indiscriminate attacks against a Russian city. And look, the piracy analogy is already found there. It wasn't invented in 1945. And they are referred, referred to explicitly as common outlaws. Let's go further back in time. Meet Wiltz. That's Wiltz. You recognize where, he, where he's been executed? On Capitol Hill. So it wasn't an insignificant event at the time. And during the, the, the military commission that tried him, the, the judge advocate refers to Wiltz and his accomplice as outlaws. Now, Wiltz was not the only war criminal to be tried during the American Civil War. There are different numbers. I, I found already a source that says that there were 4,000 cases. And these cases were, some of them were made before the Liberal Code, some of them were made after the Liberal Code, and I, I even have a case in which the person says, I committed acts before the Liberal Codes, and therefore you cannot prosecute me. And, and the reply is, the Liberal Code is only declaratory. What is really obligatory is the, the unwritten customary in international law. Going back in time, this is my favorite document. It's a pamphlet from 1812 trying to convince the Germans to declare Napoleon an outlaw. Why do I love this, this uh, document? Because it's trying to convince the German, and in what language is it written? <laughs> in English. I don't know why. But what you see here is both a reference to, to Napoleon as an outlaw and as an enemy of mankind, which gives an indication that these were synonyms, synonym terms. But you say, fine, that's a person spreading a pamphlet. That's, a not an that's not an official document. Here's the official declaration of the powers. Outlaw in Napoleon, and the term that they use is enemy and disturbers of the tranquility of the world, meaning an international outlaw. Let's go back in time. Now you recognize William Wallace? Watch, watch the film, an excellent film. Now, they had in the time a problem that we know, that we face even today. War crimes are so horrible that no crime, no punishment is sufficient in order, uh, it's sufficient for that criminal. So what they used to do at that time is to nearly kill you several times, each time for a different crime. And that's what they did for Wallace. Wallace was drawn for treason, 
hang for robbery and homicide, disemboweled for sacrilege, now is dead, beheaded as an auto and quartered for diver diverse depredations. This is why at the end of the movie, if you remember, you only see a girl giving him a flower and the flower falls from his head, hand because that is something you don't want to show <laughs> on the screen. Let's go further back in time. Meet von Hagenbach. That's the actual mummified head of, of Peter von Hagenbach. I got the permission from the Colmar Museum to use the picture. <laughs> What's nice is that's the diary of the chaplain of Basel from that time. And he reports that von Hagenbach was tried for tyranny, treason, and sodomy. Tyranny is the important uh, element because tyrants were the first to ever be referred to as enemies of mankind, already in Roman law, not pirates. So the doctrine was applied to, to von Hagenbach as well. Let's move further back in time. Meet Konarzin, also known as Konar the Younger. He's, depending on the source you rely, he's either 14 or 17. He's very young, and look for what he's tried. A sentence of death was, was declared against him as a disturber of the public peace. Again, an outro. Now, there are many, many more cases. When I, when I wrote the paper, I, I, I needed, of course, to give many more examples in order to show continuity, and I trace it from the late Middle Ages to modern times. I, I will only give you one additional example in order to show that it's not only these examples, and that's this case. Meet John the Fearless. John the Fearless, the Duke of Burgundy, is having a, a baron war against the heir to the French throne. They are meeting in order to negotiate a truce. It was customary to do such meetings on a bridge at the time. And during the meeting, the French heir assassinates John the Fearless. That is even a war crime today. That is the assassination of a parliamentar. That's a customary uh, a uh, war crime today, a form of perfidy. Look how it was referred to at the time. So it, w I needed to find a, a, a Latin source in order to find that. The French source supplied that. The perpetrators were referred to as international outlaws. Now what's nice about that case is that John the Fearless was a friend of Henry V, King of England. So after, after, and it's important, it's after, after the assassination, King Henry joins the war. And he catches some of the perpetrators and put them to trial, which is universal jurisdiction, because he wasn't part of the conflict during the time that the, that the, uh, uh, that the crimes were committed. One of the people that he execute that he put on trial and sentenced to death is Barbasan. And the fact of the matter is that the story about universal jurisdiction being applied only to piracy is complete myth. That doctrine was applied until the 19th century to war crimes, to piracy, and actually also to felonies. Felonies were considered international crimes. During the 19th century, gradually felonies, meaning rape, murder, arson, theft, robbery, stopped being considered uh, international crimes. But the fact that they were considered international crimes served as inter in inspiration, at least partially, for the development of our modern notion of crimes against humanity. Because these felonies were referred to in the context of interventions in the 19th century as crimes against humanity. All good and well. I published the paper and people came to me and say, yeah, but the real story is version number two. International criminal law was born after World War II because Nirenberg was the first international criminal tribunal. So let's see if the second version is true. Now I should point out that, so just to remind you, there are two, in here there are two earlier cases that are relevant. The failed attempt to prosecute German war criminals during World War I, that is easy to dismiss saying it's failed and therefore it's not true precedent. And the trial of Peter von Hagenbach, 
which is also easy to dismiss because it's 500 years difference and you cannot claim for continuity between something that happened 500 years before World War II. So let's see. This is the trial of von Hagenbach. Let's see if that's the only case. And it's not. Remember this guy? He was sentenced to death by Henry V. Do you think that he liked being sentenced to death? No. So what did he do? That's Middle Ages. What can he do when a king sentenced you to death? It took an English source from the time to find that. Officers in Arms was a medieval guild of law of war experts. And they and he appeals to them and they accept his appeal for a weirdest reason of all. There was a medieval law of war that said that if you fought a person in a duel within a cave and both of you survived, you become brothers in arms. And brothers in arms cannot kill each other. This is the reason that Henry V specifically could not have sentenced Barbasan to death. And therefore, he, he changes the sentence to life imprisonment, which was a nice development for Barbasan, for, because nine years later, he's been released. And this is not the only case. I'm going to give you just the most common versions or the most common forms of international uh, criminal tribunals at the time. One of the most common, this is the earliest example that I found, is inter-allied tribunals. When two forces fight together, they would sometimes create a joint tribunal in the treaty, creating the alliance, usually in one of two cases, either when it's cross uh, so like soldiers from both sides uh, having a conflict, or when it comes to very high-ranking uh, of, of officials. Now, Curry, researching this treaty, is saying, such treaties su suggest the existence of an international code of military discipline. Here is another common example. During the Middle Ages, and this disappeared later, as we'll talk about, it was very common when two sides would sign a truce agreement to create a joint tribunal to punish violators of the truce. Now, truce violations, according to some, not everyone, but according to some, is even today considered an international, a war crime. And there were two versions of, of these tribunals. Either you appoint a third party, such as the Council of Basel, or you create a joint tribunal of, ju of military judges from both sides. Keen researching this tribunal is saying their position was much more like that of modern international courts. And these were criminal courts. Another common practice at the time was creating joint tribunals in marshes, which were actually a permanent version of these truce tribunals. You see it even in the term used for these tribunals in the, the English-Scottish marshes. Now, the Scottish and the English were sorry, devout enemies for centuries. And yet, in the English-Scottish marshes, there, were, there was for centuries a joint tribunal that dealt with cross-border felonies and truce violations during a time of truce. Now, marshes existed throughout Europe, this version of marshes. There were several versions of marshes. This version of marshes you can find elsewhere. And they were, they were all not only related to the phenomena of truce for, uh, tribunals, they were also related to a greater phenomena of co-sovereignty, what we call condominium. You had territories that for various reasons were controlled by several sovereigns. And in that context, each sovereign, sometimes each sovereign had the authority to appoint some of the judges to the bench of the, of the superior tribunal of, of the territory. In Andorra, this is the reason that even today, some of the judges in the Andorran Supreme Court are appointed by the French president. But you have also closer to here, 
Maastricht was a condominium, and you had the joint conquest of the Swiss League. It was a very loose league. They didn't have a joint tribunal, but when they conquered the territory together, only the league member that participated in the conquest had the authority to appoint judges to the relevant territory. So in each territory, there was a different bench. What happened when we moved to early modern times? Marshals disappear, truce tribunals disappear. Because if you have the beginning of centralization and, the, and the, the, gra the beginning of the gradual process that will bring about the rise of the state. But while these disappear, and instead of marshals, you have non-criminal, you can find non-criminal bo cross border crossing tribunals, international criminal tribunals do not generally disappear. So one of the best examples is of, of her. Anybody recognize it? This is Bloody Mary, Mary Queen of Scot. Now Mary Queen of Scot ha has experienced two trials during her stay in England. She does a, a civil war in Scotland. She runs away to England, expecting her cousin to protect her. What her cousin does instead? Arrest her and put her in trial for crimes committed in Scotland. What were the crimes? The crimes were adultery. Adultery was considered an international crime because it was a violation of the law of nature. And it was actually the most strongly enforced sex-related crime during early modern times, more than rape. So they took adultery seriously. And assassination, because she was accused for poisoning her, her husband. Oh. So a joint military tribunal is appointed consisting of judges, English judges, and Scottish judges from each of the three parties to the civil war, including Mary Queen of Scots appoints judges to tra the tribunal herself. And how do we know that they treated it as an international crime? Because Queen Elizabeth sends her messenger to say, to say the following. So it's, it's explicitly referred to as crime against law and nature. That she would be infamous to all princes in the world. Now that trial ends in a hung bench. So she's, she's, she remains in, imprisoned only for Elizabeth to, to uh, frame her for an attempt of assassination and then put her on trial in an English tribunal. But the first tribunal was an international tribunal. But this is a rare example. Let's move to more common examples. The practice of having joint allied tribunals become much, becomes very common. It's always an exception. It's not, usually the treaties would say that each side deals with their own criminals, but you have many treaties in which you have joint tribunals. Here are a few examples. Hendrix, that researched the, uh, the, these tribunals that the British and the Hanover did together, says that this practice makes clear that they, of the international nature of the customs and disciplines of war. Now, what we see in some of these tribunals, and that's the example of von Hagenbach. Von Hagenbach's uh, tribunal, medieval tribunal, was a military tribunal, and you see it in some of the other examples even later. It, is that sometimes these military tribunals also prosecuted captured enemy combatants, meaning war, uh, prisoners of war, for war crimes. And here is one example. There's a French attempt, assassination attempt against the English king. Now assassination according to some is still, in an, but if narrowly defined is still considered a war crime today and they catch the person in charge of, the French representative uh, in charge of the assassination, and he is tried by a um, court martial consisting of English, Dutch, and Huguenot. These are not the French on the French king side, but Huguenot French commandos. 
what we also begin to find in some of the in these treaties are articles referring to protection of civilian population by joint tribunals. So here's one example, the earliest I found. Here is, an, here is a second example. Now, the, there's a dispute on the extent that the, whether the Russian were part of the, of the application of the law of war at the time, but nobody disagrees that the French and the Savoy were part of the, of the area in which the law of war were applied. And here you have a, the creation of a joint tribunal with this very important term, my parte, that is found elsewhere in the context of uh, joint tribunals. Also, while marshes disappear, cost sovereignty does not disappear. So some co cost sovereign entities continue and new ones are created. So for example, here in the Netherlands, at the time, it was a very loose league. They didn't have a, a joint Supreme Court. But when the territories that they held together, each member of the league appointed a representative to the bench in this generality lens. What you also see in that period is the transition from conquest, from territories being held when once conquered as being part of the territory of the sovereign, to the idea of occupation. Now, the transition was gradual and nonlinear and so on, but one area in, that in which considerable element of the development occurred is really nearby, is in the Dutch barrier. And I suspect, me and Renander are going to discuss it tomorrow, I suspect that there was an international criminal tribunal there because that area was run. It was an Austrian, it was, the sovereign was Austria, but it was run by the Dutch and the English together as a barrier region against the French and the Spanish. And I suspect that the joint commission, the joint giant Dutch English Commission had international, served also as an international criminal tribunal. Where I find it already explicitly is half a century later, during the Seven Years' War, the allies, these allies, UK, Prussia, Hanover, Brunswick, Hasse, and Ripper, they are all fighting together, and during the winter you don't fight, it's too cold. So they are only holding the territories together. And there's a mechanism for, uh, for preventing and deciding disputes between the troops and inhabitants in all territories, meaning both allied ne neutral and occupied territories held by the allies. And the, this regulation create for that purpose a commission with penal authorities in certain matters in which there is a general of each nation. But you say all that is good and well. There weren't really states at the time, so you cannot call it an international criminal. I even know the 18th century already there, there are relatively states, but still this is not the kind of, of modern practice that we expect. Probably there's a gap of at least 19th century, the height of positivism, surely there, there won't any international criminal tribunals, and therefore we can still consider uh, Nirenberg to be the, the first. Well, well, the fact of the matter that I'm not the first to expose international criminal tribunals from the 19th century. These, there are several researchers, these are the leading ones, that have uh, uncovered several international criminal tribunals from the time. Here is the the, one of the first to be uncovered. There's in nine, 1894, an East incident between French forces and uh, Siamese, meaning Thai forces. And that incident is, again, a violation of the truth. And some, some French soldiers are being killed. It is referred to at the time as a violation of just gentium. And they create a joint tribunal. Another case to be uh, uncovered by these researchers is 
is the case of the International Military Commission at Crete. Crete was held from 1897 to 1909, 1913, depending on how you count, by, by four powers, originally by six and then very soon by four powers together in a joint occupation. And during that period, after a year of occupation, there are uh, anti-Christian riots and several local Christian and several British soldiers are being hurt. And there's a creation of several tribunals, one of them, or actually two international military commissions with penal authorities. Now, the judges in these commissions were British, but why it was referred to as international? Because the confirming authority, which is a kind of an appeal uh, uh, instance, was the commander, it was actually the commanders of the, of the forces. So this is why it was referred to as international. Lastly, the most glaring example is the, tri the tribunal in, during the Boxers' War, now, the Boxers' War was clearly motivated by colonialist uh, motivations, but at the same time, it was an international uh, intervention aimed to prevent the killing of Chinese Christians. About, if I remember correctly, 30,000 Chinese Christians were killed, and 200 uh, Europeans, but 30,000 uh, Chinese Christians. Now, their acts were defined at the time as crimes against the law of nation, against the law of humanity. Which is surprising because according to the accepted history, the term crimes against humanity was only invented 14 years later in the, in the Armenian, in the context of the Armenian massacre. Now in that context, a joint military tribunal was created in Pao Thing Fao to punish some of the, of the boxer perpetrators. You notice that the Germans were part of the, of the tribunal, which makes their claims in World War II that it's uh, unprecedented, that the fact that they are tried more, le less, less uh, reliable. Here's, a, here's a, a drawing from the time of the execution of some of the perpet of a perpetrator. Notice the different uniforms. These are commanders of different armies that were part of the commission. Now I have mm, the utmost respect to these researchers. They have motivated me to, to dig further, but I have only one criticism of their research, and that is that they treat their finding as experiments, as nascent, meaning they only pull the, 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 the birth date a bit back. But was it, were, were these tribunals so rare at the time? So, first of all, regarding Crate, I agree with the definition that the commission that they uncovered from 1898 was international because this is the way the people treated it at the time. But what they missed is the fact that that was a spin-off of a really international criminal tribunal that functioned in Crate from a year earlier to the end of the occupation. Here is a picture of that tribunal from 1909. I'm, I'm presenting it with the permission of the, of the Greek National uh, Museum. And in the beginning, it cons consisted of commanders from all the six powers. Later, it would consist of powers of, of, of the four. Now, this was a common practice. Few years later, when there was an intervention in Albania, they did the same. It only took to find a, a, a paper in Albanian in order to uncover this tribunal. Remember the, the tribunal in China? Five years earlier in China, there's before the Boxers' Revolution, there's the Vegetarians' Revolution. And again, two international commissions are created. This is a picture of the international commission and at Kochang, and you see British officers, uh, American officers, alongside Chinese judges as well. 
Now, when in the public discourse that led to the creation of these two tribunals, look what is referred to as a precedent. The tribunal created a year earlier the, in Siam. So they were aware of, of, the practi of, of the different practices. The same I have indication that during the Boxer War, there was awareness of the tribunals it had created. And, and I'll, I'll, it's not clear-cut indications, but there are hints that they were aware of it. It's something that I need to investigate further. And even if you go earlier, you find again, during the Second Opium War, when Chao is, is held by a joint French-British occupation, they create a joint French-British-Chinese tribunal. Sadly, they won't. It wasn't an equal treatment. They forced the Chinese judge to sit on a lower bench and not to, to speak during the deliberation. But if you say, okay, you jump 20 years, so this is just one example from, from the 80s, there's an anti-colonialist rebellion in Egypt, and at a certain point the British interfere, and they succeed to stop the, 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 the rebellion. In the beginning, they treat the, the Egyptian government as an ally. Later, it would turn into a British occupation of Egypt. But right in the beginning, they treat the Egypt government as allies, and look what they wish to create. And what's nice is the charges are for violation of the right of war, meaning the laws of war, in the context of a civil war. Long before, the myth says that the law of non-international armed conflict only began 50 years later. <coughs> Here is the guy. Here is the leader. In the end, I should, I should point out, he was tried by an Egyptian tribunal, but others were tried by, uh, by the mixed Egyptian-English tribunal. Okay, so maybe it's not that important because it's... Uh, actually only in the context of imperialistic and colonialistic uh, context. They wouldn't do it in, in the relationship between European powers. <coughs> but look what Ramin Ser uncovered last year. There's an incident between the British and the Russians in the, in the uh, Northern Sea, and they create a joint commission with penal authority that decides, by the way, that Russia is responsible, but the commander is not criminally liable, which is nice. We want criminal tribunals sometimes to acquit as well. There's actually even one case from during, actually there are more, but the, here's an example of case from during World War I. There's an intervention in the Russian Civil War and the powers jointly here, hold the Archangel area together with white Russians and they create a joint tribunal. And all, uh, there were four Russian judges and one judge from each ally. But my problem is that I mean, there de describes his president, his case as unprecedented. So maybe uh, these are still isolated cases and also there's a gap, there are 50 years that I haven't told you about, right? Here is a partial list of tribunals from the 19th century. We actually we are applying for a grant, and we made a list of the of the of the of the tribunals we we uncovered thus far. We have 50 tribunals. 20 of them are from the 19th century. So we actually uncovered more tribunals from the 19th century than the amount of tribunal, tribunals created since Nirenberg on war. So now the million dollar question. Why was it this forgotten? So I think that there are several explanations. First of all, the trauma of the World War made many people think that it's easier to explain it as a lack of law than a huge violation of existing law. You cannot believe that a law existed and people simply disregarded it. So the nicer story, the, the, the easier to digest story 
is a story of there wasn't any go, and here now we are creating a new go to deal with this problem. The other element of the story is the rise of positivism, positivism during the 19th century. Posi positivists were great cheaters. They advanced their perspective of the law by saying that that is already the law. And because they were extremely successful in the domestic level, and most people learn domestic law before they learn international law, they succeeded to sell their version of the story. The thing is that military lawyers remained a, a sect that tended to disregard what's going on outside. And this is why, even during the height of positivism, the older practices remained within military culture. And they survived there until they were ex their application expanded again after World War II. This is why you can find the lawyers after World War I really believing that it's something new near a military lawyer that simply assumes that that was always the case. And I think that the third element of the story, and it's the most relevant to, to our present days, is something in the culture of international lawyers. We are manic, depressive, amnesic people. Meaning, if you open papers of international law from any period, it would include the following three elements. It would first begin with saying, it used to be really bad, then we made great advances, but now there's a crisis that is taking us back. We need to resist it and push the law further. Now, there's a good element to it. It rallies people around in order to, gra to create great advances. But it, the dynamics that it creates is the era erasing of the history. We rely on the precedent enough for, for the law to remain, but we erase the history of the law because of this dynamic. So there's something manic, because we believe that we are innovators, depressive, we are see always in a crisis, and it's always unprecedented crisis, and amnesic. We, because we only read what was written, usually what was written in the last 20 years, we start to believe the narrative that was told in previous papers like that, and we forget the history that is usually much longer of, of the different norms and institutions. That's it. No. some time for questions. I know that it's always hard to ask the first question, and I, and I, I encourage you to ask questions because it's an ongoing research. So we, I need, we need, I have a partner, Benedict Pripke from Freiburg University, we need your questions because that's the way we know where, where are the, the missing, the holes that we need to fill yet. So please, any question only helps us with our, with our research. You need to ask the first question, otherwise... I please. have to actually, one very small one out of curiosity, on one of the slides, but you didn't mention it, is something of the Sea Inquisition of 1571, yes. what's that? And then a more fundamental question, maybe, or a hypothesis. Listening to your list of examples, ranging from the Middle Ages, fascinating list from, from the Middle Ages to uh, World War One or Two, um, I was getting this idea locked in my mind, maybe it's rubbish, so then just that there seems to be two kinds of um, international tribunals of some kind or international criminal prosecutions. One like the, the, the Marshals Committee or the Joint Committees for Tribunals for Occupation seem to be where there's a kind of coordination from jurisdiction coming bottom-up. When two national jurisdictions or bottom-up jurisdictions, maybe a less contingent term, are coordinated and jointly exercised for it obviously can be very practical reasons, but there's also cases with hints of universal jurisdiction. Now, like for instance the prosecution of um, Mary Queen of Scots mm -hmm. uh, on this basis, or the courts of the heralds, of course, obviously, um, uh, the war of war officers, as you call them, as the, the guardians of the laws of war, the customs of war in the Urabelli in the Middle Ages. Now, if you go back to the Middle Ages, you can very well understand, of course, this idea of universal jurisdiction in the multi-layered uh, context of what is in the end a legal space of canon law, Roman mm -hmm. law, feudal law. Could you also say that you still have this kind of hints of universal jurisdictions in the later early modern period in the 19th century? And if so, in what context? On, in what, what would be then the, the story behind it or the background behind it? Okay. So 
So I'll start with a smaller question, the same physician. Does a holy league created uh, of, uh, of uh, Spain, the Pope, the po Pope states and several more Italian uh, uh, sovereigns aim to fight the Ottoman and the Barbar uh, pirates? In that context, the Spanish king is afraid that his uh, devout soldiers would become tem uh, tempted by the Italians to do non-Christian stuff. So he goes to the Pope and they create together the sea inquisition that uh, is in charge with prosecuting heresy-related crimes. And the definition for heresy-related crime is very wide and it includes the prosecution not only of soldiers of the league, but captured enemy soldiers who were Christians that converted to, Mas to, to Islam. So it's a very, very interesting uh, case. To the other question, first of all, I think that we need to go one step back. And that is, during the, the high Middle Ages, it was very common to create mixed tribunals. So if you have Franks and, 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 and different Germanic tribes, the, when they, there was a cross-tribal uh, 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 crime, they would create together a, a tribunal. What happened is that once you have the territorial uh, sovereigns, they start to, to uh, abolish these practices. But some of the guilds in the periphery, some of the guilds succeed to maintain it by claiming that their guild is a, a universal is a universal guild, and the two guilds that are most more, that are most successful in that is the merchants guild, and this is why you have mixed tribunals and later consular tribunals that continue through early modern times, and the knights and later the warrior guild, they claim that they are not only fighting for their sovereign they are guardian of the Christian peace. All Christians are Roman and they are guardians of Pax Romana. And this is why in, in that context from a, a jurisprudential perspective, a universal notion remains. Of course, there's also the practical reasons. You, you are fighting with the allies, it's, it's easier. You are holding a territory together, it's easier to solve the, to solve the, the dispute. But the framing that uh, enables it, it's a perception of all warriors as members of, of, a, of, a, of an international guild that, that is charged with maintaining, how it sounds surreal, but they are charged with maintaining the peace. And elements of that remain throughout and even become stronger during the 18th century because of the trauma of the religious war. So you have that as one layer of universality. You have another layer of universality of, of the perception of most crimes as, as being violations of international norms, of being violations of the law of nature of na nations, or even earlier, the law of God and man. And that notion also makes it easier to create international criminal tribunals, and there's always the practical considerations. Without the practical consideration, it wouldn't happen, but I think that without the jurisprudential structures that will allow it, that were able to allow it, it would not have happened as well. So both elements remain and, 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 and continue in, no, not, not linearly, but very, very unstably throughout, uh, throughout the century. Hey, how are you? Hey, <laughs> sorry, I, maybe this isn't a question, but I just wanted to ask you, because you mentioned that you but uh, I was I was wondering in the cases that you mentioned or that you looked at, to what extent there was a very clear line drawn between, uh, in terms of the substance of the crimes itself, between the national and the international character of them. Because I I also have some cases in the British colonial context where tribunals are organized after conquest has taken place and then they. Uh, prosecute uh, indigenous uh, rulers, and and in those cases, um, there seems to be also some confusion on the side of the Western power to what extent that they are in fact applying international law or national law. So, what do you find that also with the cases that you're looking at, and what how would you brand these uh, these types of cases? 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna do a, a simplification and then I'll explain where I simplify. Yeah. Okay. So roughly speaking, before the 19th century, the perception of the relationship between international crimes and domestic crimes was very different than today. Domestic crimes were either a reflection of an international crime or an adaptation of the international crime to the, con to the local conditions or a domestic crime created out of necessity uh, of the king or some custom, local customs. These are the four categories because God managed, originally it was a perception that God like, like physical, uh, uh, the laws of physics. There are some that apply all over, there are some that apply only in certain climates. So the, these are the, 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 this is the analogy. So for example, originally, common law crimes, the crimes was, were perceived as international, but the jurisdiction, common law courts only had jurisdiction if it was also a violation of the king's peace. So you have in felonies, felonies was an international crime, but the common law courts have all, uh, only had jurisdiction. This is a simplification, which is already messy <laughs> in itself. Of course, there were, were different perspectives. So for example, you had already in the 17th century in England, uh, Cook and others saying, no, 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 no. There's distinct common law that is different than the uh, uh, than the uh, use gentium and, and it applies because it's a com it was a competition between them and other courts in England that claimed to apply universal law. So it, that forced them to develop a much to develop a much stronger notion of domestic law and and to define it as much more distinct than uh, than previously from from the international notion. Notion, but Locke was not. It was one view. There were other views in England even that saw even for much later a greater connection to, to the international notions. Also, to make things more complicated, even regarding international crimes, they, they thought that the procedural law should apply according to the jurisdiction. Now, there was a dispute if it was the justice, there was a dispute whether the procedural law should be the one of the court prosecuting the person or the procedural law was should be, even in that court, should be the court of the, of the place where the crime was committed. Now, the thing is that they had a very wide definition of what is procedural law, and it, for example, included the severity of punishment. So we, the picture is very messy, but the, the bottom line is that the relationship between universal notions of crime and, and, and domestic notions of crime were much more fuzzy and intermixed than, than today, and that persists even through, throughout much of the 19th century. Hey. Hey, is it nice to see you again. Um, uh, so this is a fantastic, very interesting um, presentation. And I guess and not being a historian, um, I'm going to ask a fairly you know, a historical question. Um, but I'm, I'm really fascinated what, with one of these explanations you gave at the end about why this has been forgotten, and, and particularly how you identify the role of um, prominent role in the 19th century of military uh, lawyers um, in many of these tribunals which were created under military apparatuses of states. Um, and it seemed kind of in retrospect then that largely the professionals involved in the, in the different tribunals that you covered kind of evolved from first being diplomats of some sort and at times also uh, military commanders to then being military commanders or military lawyers to then in the um, World War II and post-World War II setting, to now being largely right judges, it would be um, fairly crazy of us to appoint uh, a military lawyer to the ICC as, as a judge, I think, but I'm not There's sure. not even a demand for to, to, be a, to have a military law expert in, in, in the ICC. Exactly, yeah. And, and so I guess I'm, I'm wondering if um, why these shifts of professions evolved um, if you have any insights as to why that would be the case. And perhaps, I mean, my first hypothesis would be that today we tend to think of, of ICL as pertaining primarily to military leaders, right? to, to heads of, of armies, to commanders. And if that's the case, then it does seem like we wouldn't want to have subordinates or you know, officers within the military being principal 
professionals in the judging of military leaders. And so we have, we have tra transferred this into a largely civilian exercise. Um, but I don't know how well that holds historically, because in many of the cases you show, there's also leaders of armies being tried. In many of the cases, it's not, right? In some of the cases, it's just civilians being tried, you know, low-level officers, um, or else you know, people entirely not related to the, to the army. So to what extent is this about a shift in, in who the criminal is of international criminal law? Or is there something else that, that might describe so, it? So, OK, so f first of all, in many changes in history, the true story is not the rise of something new, yeah. but the disappearance of a, of a competing element. Uh, or the weakening of a, of a competing element. We, we always want to see the rise of something. <laughs> but it's actually the demise of something, and we forget it, because it disappeared. So if you look at the history of international criminal law, and you go into medieval times, you have many forms of international tribunals. As the state centralizes, as the sovereign entity centralizes, they abolish more and more of these practices. And it remains in the periphery. The two peripheries in which it remains is the merchants and the soldiers. The merchants then disappear in the 19th century. The, the, in the context of the soldiers, it's remained because war, by, by definition, is, is, a, is an international interaction, and you, you need a quick response. If you want a quick criminal response, you, want, you, want, you need it relatively quick. But even there, it, it gets weakened. And that brings the second element of, of the story, and it's an element that I thought a lot of, and I even wrote a paper that, that addresses that, along with certain other issues. In the context of the law of war, throughout the last 200 years, you have a competition between four different kinds of lawyers. And of course, there are many in the middle, but for simplification matter, that's described as four different camps. One camp is the military lawyers. The other camp is the status-oriented lawyer, okay? Trump's lawyer, no. The other is the IHL-oriented lawyer, the, human, the humanitarian. And the other is what we today is the international human rights lawyer, but originally the peace-oriented lawyer, war skeptic. They usually were oriented uh, to deal with youth at Berum, but with an orientation of, of, of preventing war. What's interesting that they got into the business of the law of war, really shaping youth in Berum in the last uh, 50, or depending on your count, 20, 40, 50 uh, years. And each of them has a completely different story of the history of IHL with a different starting point. For the status, it's Vespalia. For the warrior, for the military lawyer, it's the Middle Ages. For the humanitarian, it's Solfino. For the, for the uh, human rights, it's 48 or even 79, meaning the, the additional protocols. And, and you, you open a paper by a member of, tell me what's their description of the starting point of IHL, and I will tell you which camp they belong to. And the story is that in the last, hundred years, the place of the military in, in Western societies decreases. How many of, of the politicians today come from military background compared to 50 years ago? How many people in, in public administration? Now, my country is the exception. So I, I, I'm a bit able to notice it because, because who we are, who I, I, I saw that perspective. But as the role of, of military uh, personnel in general and military lawyers specifically in the public discourse in, in Western society decreases. Their influence on the shaping of the of, of of different structures in international law decreases. And what's nice is because it's a, a, a story of a disappearance, not of an appearance, it's not being told. The history tells there was a rise. There's not a history of there was a decrease. I think we have to uh, <laughs> end this session because the time is up and I would invite you to join me in another round of applause for our wonderful uh, speaker today. So we can stop filming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's great. Thank you. Very interesting. The audience wasn't very good. Hopefully we'll get a bigger audience. Uh,